murderers, serial rapists, and airline hijackers get lighter sentences than Angelos might. So we've got a young man here from Utah He's serving 55 years on three counts of selling marijuana. And after the fact, after the three cells, the informant said, oh yes, he, he had a gun at each of those cells. Weldon was um, incarcerated for 55 mandatory years plus one day for selling marijuana. In addition to the drug conviction and other various convictions, there was testimony that during two of the drug buys and then in a search of Weldon's home, there was a gun involved. Under federal law, the first offense was five years and then subsequent offenses are 25 year minimum mandatory sentences. 1,050 worth of marijuana, so three buys, all were 350 each. He was arrested in 2004 and he was 24 years old at the time. Do you think that Weldon's involvement in the rap industry played any part in his prosecution? That probably played if not some role in Weldon being prosecuted or being going after him in the first place, at least some role in uh, the stiffness of the, uh, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office and the folks on the other side to offer anything that was reasonable to Weldon. One of the more notable people that he worked with was uh, uh, Snoop Dogg. He had some involvement with him and a number of people uh, around him. Weldon has worked with Snoop Dogg, um, badass, um, Napoleon from Tupac Shakur. He's worked with Dante Thomas, um, Doggy's Angels, um, tons of artists, uh, Daz Dillinger, um, many, many more. I don't really know all the people he's worked with. He's worked with so many. He's got quite a little history for just a few years that he's done it. I started working more closely with Napoleon, who was a protege of Tupac Shakur and a member of Tupac's hip hop group, The Outlaws. Well, Pac, he was, um, he definitely was a special individual. You know, working with Pac and the Outlaws, we was more like family. We was more like brothers. So even our work habits, it was more of a, it was just a family affair. Pac was a very professional person. It was a side of him that mo most people didn't really get to see. But myself and the rest of the Outlaws, we lived with him, you know, in the same house with him up until he passed away. It was amazing working with Pac. No, words can't express. Napoleon and I worked together on a number of songs over the years, and we eventually decided to do an album together. I think one of the things about Weldon is, uh, you know, one, like coming from the music industry, you don't really have too many sincere people, you know, that's, that's sincere, that's honest. And one thing about meeting Weldon, he was an honest person uh, from day one. I think he would have been a, an accomplished producer. I think he probably would have uh, been responsible for introducing us to uh, some young artists that we don't know today that we may well have known had uh, Weldon continued to be able to work with those people and bring their music forth. Uh, Weldon, yes, Weldon, man, he was a serious, a serious work um, guy, you know what I mean? A serious work um, habits. He made it fun, though, at the same time. You know, he did songs on myself, people like Snoop Dogg. I also believe he did some music with um, Nas as well. So working with Weldon, one, he was a serious person, but at the same time, he let us enjoy ourselves. We had a great, great time working with him. And we became very close. Napoleon ended up making some positive changes in his life and eventually left the music industry altogether. He became like a mentor to me or a positive role model, which is something I never had before. So basically, back to the story of Tupac, after he passed away, the reason why it was a wake-up call for me, because as soon as he wanted to live his life, that's when he died. Weldon also is a changed individual. You know, Weldon changed his attitude, he changed his thinking, he changed the, his way of life, you know what I mean? He realized what he wanted in life, and I think it's more important that Weldon should be home because he can help other young kids that's out in America or worldwide that's caught up in the streets. What makes his case a little bit unique is the amount of marijuana that was being transferred and the background that Weldon had, um, the fact that he was a first-time offender, um, you know, all of those things and, you know, the questionable testimony and evidence of his even having a gun. I mean, those things all 
came together in Weldon's case to make it unique in the sense that it seems particularly egregious when it's applied to him. Well, people were really disappointed tonight who were hoping to hear some opposition to Congress. Let's go ahead and take a look at what was happening out here just moments ago. All of these people were waiting to hear if Judge Castle would declare that the mandatory minimum sentencing would be unconstitutional in the case of Weldon Angelos. Now, families against mandatory minimums were also out here today using this case to voice against mandatory minimum sentencing, and this is what they had to say. We're all a little disappointed. I mean, we were hoping that we would get uh, a resolution today. Uh, we've been uh, arguing this issue back and forth, but on the, on the fair side of that, it's an important issue. It's a message sent to Congress, if nothing else, and hopefully more than that, that mandatory sentencing laws need to be reformed at a minimum and repealed would be our choice because judges need to be able to take into, a into account all the factors of a case. As a law professor, I'm interested in high-profile cases. This certainly is one. And my views of mandatory minimums have, have changed over the years. I'm a former prosecutor. I believe in the, those penalties at the outset. But given my experience with the criminal justice system, I think that they are only guaranteed to produce maximum injustice. It's not that I didn't take it serious, but I just kind of really didn't believe what was going to happen. And then when um, the last day of his sentencing, I remember I had to go back to work. And if knowing what would have happened, I never would have went back to work. I just assumed it was going to be the end, Waldo was going to come home, um, but then I get home from work and I call my dad, I said, where's Weldon, have you heard anything, and he said he didn't hear anything, and um, I kept trying to call Zandra, the mother of his boys, um, and I couldn't get a hold of her. Finally, I think it was 11.30 at night, Zandra finally called me and told me that he was getting 55 years and they took him to jail. I haven't told this story in so long, so I apologize. But it was just like the worst. I just remember how terrible it was. And so I hurried and just left and drove to Xandra so I could be there for her and my nephews. It was just, it was horrible. I just remember how sad it was for those poor little boys because he was such a good father. I mean, those kids looked up to him like he was the most amazing man in the world. And the judge had no discretion. And as conservative as this judge is, he said, this is an outrage, it's unjust, it's cruel, it's unusual, doesn't fit the crime, but my hands are tied because of Congress. He felt bound by the law. He felt bound by the U.S. Supreme Court precedent, and even though it was pretty clear in the opinion that he didn't want to reach a certain result, he felt like it wasn't really his place to, um, to declare the sentence invalid or to not impose the 55 years when he thought uh, the law required him to do it. And so I think once he got to the bench, often his decisions, and at least the one here, reflected his reputation as a fairly conservative uh, law professor and judge. Judge Cassell was visibly upset with the minimum mandatory sentence that was required uh, and uh, expressed that uh, he did not feel that that was at all fair. He went to so great lengths to compare Weldon's sentence to, you know, the sentence of drug traffickers or airplane hijackers or rapists and to show that Weldon's sentence was much harsher than what those sort of criminals would receive. I know people, for example, in my neighborhood that committed murder. I know people in my neighborhood that shot people and did maybe five years in prison. This is an individual that got caught with marijuana and they giving them the same time as a terrorist who will hijack a plane. I don't think that this make any sense at all. Dozens of former U.S. attorneys, former federal judges, former United States attorneys general, and even one former director of the FBI who signed on to an amicus brief contending that the 55-year sentence in Weldon's case was cruel and unusual.
national papers were here today have done coverage. This man sold marijuana once when he had a gun on him. That's five extra years. Did it again, 25 extra years. Had a gun at home, that's another 25 extra years. His family was shocked by the sentence. It's wrong. A young kid goes to prison for 55 years for a bag of marijuana. It's wrong. It was really an amazing group. It wasn't just U.S. attorneys, but the fact that the bulk of the group was U.S. attorneys who are federal prosecutors, basically, and are the ones who enforce the laws and ask courts to impose 924C sentences. The fact that a group full of those people were asking the U.S. Supreme Court to help find a way to give district court judges the discretion to apply 924C in a more rational way. I think that was pretty significant. Even as a prosecutor, there were times I felt that the sentences I was advocating for made me a little uncomfortable. And I did feel that the sentencing guidelines left district court judges with very little discretion. They were like machines or, or calculators in certain ways, just taking formulas and numbers and adding them up and spitting out a sentence. And I had always felt that the the, the, the compassion, if you will, and I know it's a little bit of an odd thing to think about, compassion for um, defendants who have committed sometimes fairly violent and very violent crimes, but I felt that the system of justice really required a human being to be able to analyze any individual case and look at the circumstances, the aggravating factors, the mitigating factors, and bring their own life experience, the things which made them qualified to be judges in the first instance, in determining what an appropriate sentence would be. And so when I had this opportunity to get involved on behalf of Mr. Angelos, I really felt highly motivated and I thought it would be a great way to try and have some impact on an individual, an individual human being's life, if you will. It took the U.S. Supreme Court a couple of weeks to decide whether to deny the petition. Ultimately, they did, but um, I think the fact that it took them so long and they gave it as close a look as they did, had a lot to do with their involvement and their filing an amicus brief asking them to take it. So it was an amazing group and it helped a lot. And hopefully, you know, a very similar group is going to be coming together to ask President Obama to do what Judge Cassell asked to be done in his order, which is to commute the sentence down. Because that's really the last safety valve. I mean, once the judiciary um, is unable to do something about the sentence that Congress mandated. We're really just left with um, presidential pardon authority to step in to do something about the sentence. And so at this point, that's really the last hope. The more attention we can bring to this, the more pressure there's going to be for the president to do exactly what the Constitution says he can do. I believe if a person make a mistake, so commit an error, um, he definitely should face responsibility. We're not saying that nobody is above the law. We believe that everybody should be held accountable according to what they do. But at the same time, we have to be a just nation. You know what I mean? You have to treat the people with justice. And I believe Weldon played his part. He did his time. And he's a changed man. Weldon has a wife. He has a family. And it's only right that he should be home with his kids to raise his children. If the whole prison system is set up, so that it can rehabilitate the people where Weldon is a rehabilitated person. What would you want to say to your dad, if you could, when you see him? I love him. I miss him very much. He's an amazing guy, and I hope he gets to spend uh, part of the next 20 years with his kids instead of uh, in prison. People have this tremendous capacity to turn others into abstractions. If they don't know them on a human level, if they don't put a face to people, you hear the word inmate, you hear the word convict, you hear the word criminal, and you're able to just shut them out. You lock them away, you put them in this little box and shut them aside. And you don't realize these are human beings. They have life stories. They have people who love them. And some of them, their situations are very tragic. We lose so much of our own humanity if we don't endeavor to get to know the other, even if they're people who have violated our laws. It, it doesn't matter uh, what walk of life we come from. I think that 
the majority of the American people, we want good for each other. And I think it's only right that they should pay attention to Weldon Case and try to support this individual. This is a person who, who did his time. He has children. This is a person who was influential in the music industry. And I, I believe if he come home and have a chance, he can save a lot of young kids in America on the streets. Weldon Angelos was a young man who made some mistakes. Didn't hurt anybody in the process. Didn't rape anybody, didn't murder them, didn't physically injure anybody. So a young guy made the same mistakes a lot of people make at that young age. And yet he's paying right now with what could possibly be the rest of his life in a federal penitentiary at a cost of well over a million dollars to taxpayers. And it makes absolutely no sense. Watching my baby cry So many reasons Wanna see my child grow up And be the father I never had So many reasons Sick of seeing homies saying bye-bye As they float up to the sky So many reasons